Father God, we do praise you and we thank you for giving us the great privilege to gather together now this very morning on this Lord's Day as your redeemed saints. By the grace of you, you Lord, you have shed the blood of Jesus at the cross for our sins, to make atonement for our sins, for our justification, to cleanse us uh, once and for all in your sight, to declare us right in your very presence. Lord, we thank you for this gift of salvation that you have granted unto us. And now, Lord, as we continue to look at your word and as we continue to now go forward uh, in this salvation, we ask that you would grant to us the increasing gift of sanctification, that you would make all of us, every single one of us, ever increasingly holy in your sight, uh, by grace, through faith, in you. And so, Lord, help us to apply these things. We ask that you would personally minister to every single one of our hearts this morning. You know exactly the things that we struggled with this past week, what we will go on to struggle with this upcoming week. Uh, Lord, you know our frailty and the ways that we are particularly prone to temptation. And so, Lord, we ask that you would now use your word to minister to us, to equip us in righteousness so as to be pleasing in your sight. But we ask this all in the good and the strong name of Jesus. Amen. All right. As it says here on the slide, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 22 today. So if you haven't already, I would invite you to open up to this passage, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 22, which is going to cover the entirety of the chapter. And as is usually the case, it will continue the narrative of what we've been looking at now over the last uh, several weeks where we have seen basically, uh, if you remember going back to chapter 17, David beat Goliath in the fight on one-on-one -on -one combat, and after this he became very prominent and popular in Israel, which upset Saul very much, so that in chapters 18 and 19, uh, Saul then increasingly began to persecute David. He kind of began subtly, but then he became more and more overt over time. And then, by the time we get to chapter 20, we see that uh, he just comes right out and uh, in his intentions to kill David, such that David has to go on the run. And he has to become an exile in Israel itself. He has become public enemy number one, as it were, in Israel, um, in the sight of Saul. And so, in chapters 21, 22, and 23 then, we have basically seen what David has been doing while he's on the run. And it usually just kind of revolves around this cat and mouse game of David having to run all over the place trying to evade Saul, who is constantly giving chase to David and trying to kill him everywhere he goes. It seems like everywhere David goes, somebody will recognize him, because again, he's very popular, very, he's well known, and they will then re report that to Saul, Saul will get all of his men up, and they'll go chase him there, and then David will have to run away to a new spot, and then the process just repeats. So that's kind of what we've seen basically in these last several chapters. And as we go then into chapter 24, this process will in fact continue uh, in this, this chasing game between David and Saul. So, uh, with that said, we will now read our passage in its entirety at this point. So if you please rise as we read chapter 24, verses 1 through 22, the whole chapter. This is the word of the Lord. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold! I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him, because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul arose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, Behold, 
David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the quarter of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it, and plead my cause, and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept, and said to David, You are more righteous than I. For you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good that for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me therefore by the Lord that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May you write it on our hearts by faith. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so that is the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at in greater depth for this morning. And as we were pointing out just prior to reading it, we again see here the continued uh, cat and mouse game between David and Saul, where uh, Saul has to, or, yeah, David has to run all over Israel, and Saul is constantly trying to chase him. And we basically see then the specific instances of how that all plays out in this chapter that we just read. Um, but particular, what's kind of interesting about this chapter is that in it, as we just saw, uh, David is essentially being presented with an opportunity to seize for the crown early by striking down Saul himself. All right, this is the first time where David actually has an opportunity uh, to, to actually strike against Saul personally uh, in a very easy way. And, uh, and so that's kind of what this chapter revolves around. Will he do that or will he not? And we just got done reading, so we know what happens. But that's basically what happens. And, uh, and what makes this all the more intriguing is that uh, David knows that he's going to be the next king. This has been made very uh, evident to him many times. He knows it's ultimately just a matter of time. But again, that kind of thus uh, shows the, the whole point of this text. It's kind of a testing slash even temptation. The Lord has tested him. Satan is trying to tempt him. Uh, is he going to trust the Lord to establish him as the king in God's timing? Or is David going to try and seize for the crown early by striking down Saul? That's kind of what a lot of this uh, comes down to. And what makes this all the more fascinating is actually two things. Uh, David being tested here is actually kind of the first in a series of tests revolving the same idea that is going to now uh, be prevalent in today, chapter 24, and it's, we're going to see it again in 25, and then we're going to see it again in 26. Uh, David kind of going through these very similar testings by the Lord, and thus it parallels what we actually saw Saul go through earlier in the book in chapters 13, 14, and 15. After Saul became the king, we saw him go through a series of tests where the Lord tested him whether he was going to be patient and wait for the Lord or not. Is he going to obey the Lord or not? He goes through three of those tests, and Saul failed on all accounts, and thus why the Lord then strips away the kingdom from him to give it to another, David. Uh, and so Saul failed in his three tests, and now David is going to go through a series of three tests as well. And will he pass or will he fail? That's what the text will show us. So that's one thing to point out. And then secondly, what's also fascinating is that in these next three chapters that we're going to look at, 20, 24, 25, and 26, 
uh, the phrase or the terms good and evil appear numerous times, uh, 18 times to be exact. About a third of all the use of the terms good and evil occur in these next three chapters, and thus some commentators suggest that because good and evil, good and evil, good and evil are repeated so much, it may be designed to recall the reader's mind actually back to Genesis, to the Garden of Eden, where there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and if that is the case, then this may also indicate that David's uh, testing or temptations that he's going to face here in the next couple of chapters is sort of similar to what Adam went through as well. Whereas Adam was tempted to grab for the fruit prematurely and thus rebel against the Lord's uh, timing, so David is now going to be presented as well. He's going to have this, you know, uh, forbidden fruit kind of right before his eyes. He can go at, out and reach for it early, or he can wait upon the Lord for it. And again, we're going to see how he chooses in the course of these next three chapters. Okay? So we can kind of keep those big picture things kind of in mind as we now begin to work through the text itself, uh, verse by verse. Okay? So that's what we'll do now, and then afterwards we'll apply it to our life. So, going back to verse 1 uh, of chapter 24, it begins, again, like usual, directly where we left off last week. So again, quick way of recap. We saw last week that David was uh, in the wilderness of the Ziphites, and the Ziphites told Saul about it, and so Saul chased after him, and Saul actually on this occasion got very close to capturing him. Uh, David was on one side of the mountain, Saul was on the other. The text indicates that Saul was about to overcome David, but then God intervened in the last moment, providentially, and had the Philistines attack some other location in Israel, thus diverting Saul's attention to go deal with them, thus allowing David to escape. And we saw that David then went and escaped in, at, to En Gedi which was an oasis on the western side of the Dead Sea. And so David was able to get away, and thus, uh, we're not sure how long it took for Saul to deal with the Philistine threat, or how long David was able to therefore hang out in En Gedi, but we then learn in verse 1 of our passage that somebody spots David in En Gedi and tells Saul about it. And therefore, when Saul hears, okay, there's David, my enemy, so he wastes no time and musters up 3,000 chosen men of Israel to go capture him. Right? Now, you may, again, uh, because Saul got so close to getting David the last time, it's possible that he was even able to see remnants of David's uh, people. And so he's, he realizes that he's dealing with a small band of people. We know that David has 600 men. Uh, Saul doesn't perhaps know exactly how many he has, but he may have noticed that David has hundreds of people with him now. And so he doesn't know how many, so he just gets a pretty big army of 3,000, perhaps just to feel like to be playing it safe. And he's now going to go and pursue David at En Gedi. And uh, it says that he actually goes to the Wild Goats Rocks, where there were many sheepfolds there which, uh, that's in verse 2, and uh, what's interesting, it's verse 2 and 3, uh, but what's fascinating about that is En Gedi, which is where they're going, uh, literally in Hebrew means the spring of the kid, kid as in baby goat, and, uh, and then, so apparently there was many uh, um, goats and sheep in this region, because it's the spring of the kid, the wild goats rocks, lots of sheep folds, uh, I don't know if that, uh, there's any deeper significance to highlighting all of this sheep-goat imagery, but there's lots of it there. And when they get there, they seemingly do not find David or his men, but they're in the vicinity where they are. And we're told in verse 3 that Saul then simply goes into one of the caves to relieve himself. Which is uh, simply the polite way of saying that he's going to use the bathroom in the cave. Uh, and he's not, use, he's not going number one, he is going number two. Um, the, uh, literally, in Hebrew, the, the word to relieve himself, as how it's translated, uh, it literally says he went in to cover his feet, which is a euphemism for going to the bathroom, going number two. Uh, the only other time we read about it is actually back in Judges chapter 4. Uh, if you remember, it's a time when Judge Ehud, it's a Benjamite assassin, left-handed, uh, who killed King Eglin, who frankly was a big fat king, and uh, Ehud snuck in and stabbed him in the stomach, and his fat rolls went over the handle itself. He left the blade, and he ran, and locked the door, and left. Uh, but we're told that when he stabbed him, uh, Eglin's dung came out. Uh, so, literally, what likely happened to suggest is that uh, he probably struck uh, Eglin's sphincter, which kind of involuntarily made him spill out his dung. And he then fell down dead in his own feces, and he left and locked the door. But well, we're told that uh, Eglin's attendants, or servants, were there. They didn't see any of this, but they're outside the room, and they could smell it. 
and they thought that he was in there covering his feet, it says. He, they thought he was in there going to the bathroom. And, uh, and of course, when they finally, it says they waited, 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 nothing's happening. So then they got embarrassed, they checked, he's dead, and then they sound the alarm, and the rest happens from there. But all that to say, to cover your feet is just a way of saying you're going to go number two. So uh, Saul goes into this cave, he's looking for a good spot to do this. And lo and behold, we're told that also in verse 3 that this just so happens to be the very cave that David and his men are actually hiding in, in the innermost parts of it. Uh, so it's a big cave, it's not like a tiny hole in the wall, it's, it's a big one, there's probably lots of caverns and channels and tunnels all over the place. And he, him and his men are there. And uh, this is such an you know, amazing coincidence, of course it's not, it's all by God's design and providence, but uh, it's such a, like, no way, like, that's the king, he's right there, he's coming to the bathroom, um, that many of David's men, therefore, uh, you know, plead with David to kill him. Like, they say, this is it, this is a clear sign from God that he is giving Saul, your enemy, right into your hand. You're never going to get a more easy opportunity to wipe him out than this. He's completely vulnerable right now, so you could easily dispatch of him quickly. Uh, again, like they're probably wanting this because they have to run all, all over the place with David every time Saul chases them. So they're, they're upset at Saul as well. Uh, this is a part of David that probably feels a little tempted to do this because, again, Saul has been chasing him unjustly all this time. Saul has committed lots of atrocities, lots of grievous sins. Remember, he massacred the whole city of Nob, uh, killed all of the priests already at this point. He's done horrible things. He deserves death, frankly. Um, and he does know that he's going to be the next king. David does. And so there might be a part of him that thinks, maybe this is God's sign that I'm supposed to just take him out. And so he's considering it, but in the end, we're told that in verse 4, that he sneaks up to Saul and simply cuts off a piece of his robe. Right, it's possible that David or Saul had taken it off to take care of business, um, and so David was able to just kind of go up and take it then. Or maybe Saul just kept it on while he's doing his thing, and David is just that sneaky. We're not, we're not sure exactly, but he's able to sneak up basically right up to where he was, cut off a piece of his robe, and then go back to his men. Uh, but upon doing this, we're then informed that David's heart actually struck him, uh, which is to say he became very convicted for having just done what he did. He realizes, like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. I, I erred in doing that. I sinned in doing what I just did. Um, to which we then can just kind of pause and, and consider the question as to uh, why is David so torn up about this event? Why does he feel so convicted for having simply cut a piece of Saul's robe? Because after all, he didn't actually do what his men were saying. He didn't harm David or Saul in any way. He simply cut off his robe. So why we, we look at that and say, what's the big deal? Why is that so bad? And the likely answer to why David is so uh, convicted by this is simply because, we've touched on this a little bit in the past, but the royal robe of the king actually symbolized the kingdom itself, right? The robe represents the kingdom. Uh, back in chapter 15, you remember when Saul was told to kill all the Amalekites, and he doesn't do it, and then God sends Samuel the prophet to rebuke him. He uh, tells him that you've sinned, the Lord is going to take your kingdom away, and then Saul reaches out and grabs Samuel's robe and tears it. And Samuel says, just as you tore this robe, so God is going to tear the kingdom from you. He kind of makes this connection. Robe equals the kingdom, symbolizes the kingdom. Uh, this is also why in chapter 18, when Jonathan gave his robe to David... Uh, this, this wasn't just a nice gift that Jonathan is giving him, but rather it's actually a symbolic gesture. I'm handing, like Jonathan was the crown prince, he would have otherwise become the king after Saul, but he says, I'm transferring the kingdom over to David, and he will be the next king, because the robe equals the kingdom, it symbolizes it. So, therefore, for David to come up and tear off a piece of Saul's robe, uh, was actually a symbolic declaration of war against Saul himself. It's basically saying, I'm now going to rebel against you and your kingdom. I'm going to go against you now. Okay? So that's basically what it symbolizes. Now again, we don't always pick up on it perhaps as quickly as American 21st century people because uh, we're not necessarily used to that symbol, the robe, symbolizing the kingdom. Um, but it would, it's kind of a modern equivalent would perhaps be like if somebody came in and took the communion elements... Right, right before us, and threw them on the ground and started stamping on them and spitting on it. Right? If somebody did that, there's a sense in which we could say, well, technically it's just bread and wine. 
It's, it's, I mean, that all it is, it does, you know, like, so really, that's all they're doing. They're just spitting on bread and wine. And in other contexts, we wouldn't really be bothered by that. But we know that if somebody did that to the communion elements, there's, there's more happening there. There's, there's, they're symbolically saying something. Namely, they hate Christ and they hate his church. And so we get that when it comes to the communion elements. And so it was, therefore, with the robe, though. Right? To cut the robe symbolizes that he's actually declaring war on Saul. To which then, somebody still might want to push back and say, what's wrong with that, ultimately? Because Saul's kind of asking for it. Saul has been committing uh, horrible sins. He's become a tyrant at this point. So why can't David declare war against Saul? And the truth is, while that actually is justified on certain occasions, sometimes it is right and good to go to war against tyrants. That's called war uh, at times. However... David is very upset about it, so he, he doesn't like this idea because, as he points out twice in verse 6, uh, David, Saul is the Lord's anointed. Right? He remains the Lord's anointed despite the fact that he has become a tyrant. He nevertheless has that title upon himself, and uh, thus he is uniquely set apart unto God. This is how it worked, particularly in the Old Covenant. Uh, the Lord's anointed usually were the kings and the priests. They were anointed uh, for their service. And we see elsewhere in Scripture that to go against them is actually a very egregious thing. For instance, in chapter 26, verse 9, we'll get to it in a couple of weeks, uh, it says, But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? He's referring again to Saul on a different occasion where they have another opportunity to kill him. And he says, we can't do it. He is the Lord's anointed. If we do it, despite the fact that we become a tyrant, the Lord will hold us guilty for doing that. Okay. Uh, later, in 2 Samuel 1.14, we're told uh, after Saul is actually killed by the Philistines, there's a man who finds him and then brings, him, uh, brings the report to David saying, I killed Saul. I actually did it, even though that wasn't true. But he thought he would maybe get in David's good graces if he was the one who killed him. And he was very wrong because David uh, ultimately says, uh, David said to him, How is it that you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And he then proceeds to kill or execute that man. 2 Samuel 19, 21, we see the same thing. Except at this point, David is the king, he's the anointed, and he has to flee out of Jerusalem because his son Absalom is coming to revolt. And as he's fleeing, there's a guy named uh, Shemi who keeps cursing David and saying all sorts of noxious things about him. And David doesn't do anything on his way out. And then after David is able to come back into power, uh, Abishai, Saul's, or David's servant, says, now we need to go deal with that guy who was cursing you because you're the Lord's anointed and he deserves death for cursing you like that. And David actually pardons him again. But in any case, we see from this that it's quite clear to attack, to lay a hand on, or even curse the Lord's anointed was a very egregious thing in God's sight. And really the simple reason for this is because if you were anointed, then you were specially consecrated to the Lord's service in some way. Like you uniquely belong to God. Now, of course, everything and everybody belongs to God. Ultimately, he's the creator, we're the creation. So he, he owns everything, obviously. But to be anointed, there was like a unique uh, designation unto God. And thus, to do anything to the Lord's anointed was by extension doing it to the Lord himself. That's how it worked. And this, again, is why, therefore, David is so convicted about what he just did. Uh, because by cutting off the robe, he's not just cutting off the robe of a uh, tyrant king, but by extension, it's as though he's declaring rebellion against God himself, and he recognizes, this is wrong, this is bad, what am I doing? It's as though he is, again, is Adam in the garden, and he's grabbed the fruit, he's about to put it to his lips, and then God brings him to his sense, and he says, what am I doing? I can't do this. And then he stops it, right? He realizes, I need to make this right. Okay? So that's basically what's happening. That's why he's so convicted, because this is an open declaration against God himself. And so, in light of all this, going back to our summary, in verse 7, it says he was able to then persuade his men with these words not to harm Saul. Verse 7. So, he says, okay guys, we, we can't actually do anything to Saul here. And what's kind of fascinating is when it says he persuaded his men not to harm him, uh, that's actually kind of a taming of the... The situation over like the, it's a tame word to use here because the word uh, persuade here is in Hebrew is shasa, which literally means to cleave or to tear apart. Uh, so literally translated, it's, it's David is tearing apart his men with these words. He's cleaving into them with strong words not to harm Saul, which therefore implies that there is probably somewhat of a fierce debate going on in the cave at this time. 
Which again is kind of just funny to think that they're fiercely arguing, perhaps in whispered tones, because Saul's over there, still doing his business, and they're like, really like, ah, we need to kill him. We, and uh, if you remember back in chapter 22, verse 2, we saw that a lot of David's men were people who were in distress, in debt, or bitterness of soul. And thus, this kind of implies that he's probably got some ruffians in his group with him. Uh, people who like to shoot first and ask questions later, and that's who this is. And so they're thinking, we need to get rid of Saul now. You're never going to give an easier opportunity. It has to be done. And David is saying, no, 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 we can't do this. He's tearing into them, perhaps even making threats of his own, saying, if you do this, there are going to be severe consequences. And ultimately, in the end, they listen to David, which is good. And so, thus, again, at the end of it, Dave, uh, Saul finishes his business. He has no idea what's just happened around him, and he leaves the cave. Which brings us then to verse 8, where then David runs out after him to confront him in all of this. Uh, he shouts out to him, well, first, actually, it says in verse 8, he, uh, he shouts out to De uh, Saul as Lord and King, lowercase l, lowercase k, obviously, and he bows before him to pay homage to him. So he goes out and immediately shows great reverence and respect toward Saul. Uh, he's not going out there being arrogant or rude or belligerent, but rather he's very, very respectful. And then he asks in verse 9 why Saul keeps listening to the false reports about him. Basically, whoever is in your cabinet, whoever of your men keeps saying that I'm after you, says, why are you listening to them? That's not true at all. I've never done anything to go against you whatsoever. I've only ever served you uh, whenever I was, when he was still back, you know, in his cabinet, as it were. He says, why are you listening to them? All of these reports are false. And then, uh, highlight this, he then goes on to say in verse 10 and 11 that... Uh, he just basically points out everything we just saw in the narrative. He says, I was just in the cave you were just in. I saw you going to the bathroom. I uh, could have killed you. If I wanted to kill you, I could have easily done it right then. But I didn't, you see? So that proves that I'm not out to kill you. And then he shows up the piece of cloth from the robe and says, See, I literally was able to get this from you. I was right next to you. You didn't have any clue. And you can imagine Saul looking down at his own robe, realizing, yeah, some of it's gone. And, uh, and so he sees this, and so that's, again, David's way of emphasizing, I'm not out to get you. And then he calls upon God, in verse 12, to be their judge. And even calls upon God to avenge him, um, but affirms that he, David, will not lay a hand on him. So he says, I'm not going to do anything against you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to hurt you. Uh, but God will judge this case. God will be my avenger. God will deal with you. And basically says, anything God's going to do against you is going to be far worse than anything I could do against you. And so he says, let that be known, Saul. You are in the wrong. God will deal with you because of what you've done. I'm not going to, but God will. And then he goes on to highlight his own innocence by pointing out in verse 13, he actually quotes an ancient proverb, which said that out of, wicked, out of the wicked comes wickedness which is very similar to Jesus's, uh, what Jesus said, that you will know them by their fruit. Basically saying, you know, if you're a wicked person, out of you will come wickedness. You can't, you can't, can't help it. And so, thus he says, this again is to prove his innocence, I haven't been doing anything wicked. If I were a wicked man, it would be evident in the way I behave and the way I conduct myself towards you, but I haven't been conducting myself wickedly, therefore I'm innocent in this case. He likens himself to a dead dog and a flea in verse 14 to again highlight, I'm no threat to you. Why would you send an army out to attack a dead dog? Makes no sense. That's virtually what I am. I'm not a threat. You don't have to worry about me. And then concludes once again by calling upon God to judge their situation and uh, declares that God will do right in this verse 15. Okay? So that's basically David's speech in a nutshell. He addressed him with reverence. He implores him to stop listening to the false reports about him. He says, I'm not going to harm you, even though I could have, in the cave, easily. And he says, God will be the judge in our case. God will deal with this. That's what he says to Saul, and then he ends it there. At which point, amazingly, Saul, who has become a very hardened man that we've seen in the past, actually seems to soften up a little bit. David seems to have gone through to, uh, to him a little bit in verse 16. Uh, it says he lifts up his voice and weeps, uh, and then he even calls David, my son David, which, uh, again, kind of implies that he seems to have some sort of a restoration of relationship. Prior to this, we pointed out before, that every time Saul was angry at David, he would always refer to him as the son of Jesse. So he couldn't even ever come to call him by his own name. Always that son of Jesse, son of Jesse. But here, he actually says, my son, David. Which again, simply implies that he's, uh, he seems to have got, David seems to have gotten through. 
Uh, calling him my son even seems to imply that he's kind of saying, you're right, you belong in the royal household, I was wrong for doing what I did. Because he even acknowledges in verse 17 that David has been conducting himself more righteous than him because David was treating him good while Saul was only treating David with evil. And thus further acknowledges in verses 18 and 19 that uh, David actually even deserves to be rewarded for showing mercy to him when it was in his power to kill him. It says, usually if an enemy comes into your, into your power, you kill him. That's what you do, and yet you didn't do that to me. He says, you have been more righteous. So he's making all of these acknowledgments, highlighting David's innocence, highlighting his own guiltiness. And then he makes perhaps the most staggering acknowledgement in verse 20, when he says that, yes, David, you will be the next king, and the kingdom will be established in your hands. Okay? This is like the thing that Saul has been the most afraid of this entire time. This is why he's been going so crazy, to try and prevent David from getting his throne, and now he actually concedes, yes, you will be the king, I can see this now, and the kingdom will be established. Uh, we saw Jonathan, back in chapter 23, verse 17, uh, say the same thing. He said, my father knows you're going to be the next king, but now uh, Saul says it with his own lips. So that's a very significant acknowledgement on his part. And thus, because he knows David is going to be the next king, he then further requests in verse 21 that when he does, he says, please do not destroy my offspring. Don't cut off my offspring, is what he actually says. Which may be a play on words in the fact that you cut off my robe, but please don't cut off my offspring. Uh, when you become the one in power, don't eliminate my line. We saw that uh, David had already agreed with Jonathan, Saul's son, uh, not to destroy his line earlier. But now, David affirms in verse 22 that he won't cut off Saul's line either. So he agrees to this, and thus, again, by the end of it, it seems like there seems to be some sort of reconciliation that has happened between them, and that's true in a sense. However, at the very end of verse 22, we see that uh, Saul uh, uh, goes off to his home, and David then goes back to his stronghold. So they don't go back together as if everything is restored. They're still going to say, hey, we're, we're not going to be together anymore. We're separate. We're not entirely reconciled, but we're sort of good at this point. Okay? So there's kind of a, a partial reconciliation. Um, but unfortunately, we're going to see, by the time we get to chapter 26, Saul is going to seemingly reverse his position and then go back after David once again. So, he's going he's gonna to go back. But uh, we'll see how that all plays out greater in greater depth when we actually get to chapter 26. For now, having just walked through this entire passage and basically looking at it in a nutshell, Saul on the run, he could have killed, Dave, uh, could have killed Saul in this cave. He doesn't. He then tells Saul that I could have done this, I didn't. God will be the judge between us. And Saul says, you're right, I'm going to go back home, you go back to your place. That's basically what we see in a nutshell. So, having looked at all of that, therefore we can thus spend the remainder of our time on the point of application. As we often ask, how do we apply a passage like this, which was happening for God's people, you know, 3,000 years ago at this point, how do we apply all of this to our life today in 21st century America? And to do that, what I would like to do, as always, is just kind of draw out the principles of what we see in a nutshell from here, and just really apply it to us, uh, looking particularly at the positive examples of what David does in the text. So again, keep in mind, David could have seized the crown if he wanted to uh, by striking down Saul in the cave, but he exercised restraint and instead decided to patiently wait for God's vengeance to deal with Saul instead of taking matters into his own hands. That's what we see in a nutshell, and thus, the application that I would extend to us is actually three things. Number one, obey God's word, not your circumstances. Obey God's word and not your circumstances. We actually literally made this exact point last week, so uh, I wanted to go into it as in-depth perhaps this week. But we see it's amazing how often this comes up, and it's so absolutely vital for us as Christians to have this in our mind. Uh, we are to ultimately make our final decisions based on what God's word says, not on what you know, circumstances would perhaps seem like it should be saying. So, for instance, in our case today, David's men in our passage in the cave were fully convinced, based on circumstances, that clearly it is God's will for you to strike down Saul. Like, he, he, like you couldn't get, again, an easier opportunity. God is handing him to you on a silver platter. Certainly, circumstances would dictate that uh, God wants you to kill him. 
right? If you were basing it on circumstances, it would be easy to come to that conclusion, but of course we know that that's actually not what God wanted. It was a test. Uh, you know, it was actually a test for David to be patient. So, you, if you would have based it merely on circumstances, things could have been very bad for David. Okay? And it's kind of fascinating that uh, this is very similar uh, to like a thousand years after this event, the son of David, Jesus himself, while also in the wilderness, would undergo a similar temptation. Uh, namely, just as David knows the kingdom is coming to him, and he could have tried to grab for it prematurely, so for Jesus, he knows that he's going to receive the kingdom of God. He knows that the nations are his inheritance, as it says in Psalm 2. It's all coming to him. He knows this. Uh, and so, sure enough, in the wilderness, what does Satan come and try to offer him? All the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor. Right? They all belong to him anyway. I'm, Satan's trying to offer it to him early, try to grab it, seize for it prematurely. And, uh, of course, we know that in order to do that, though, Jesus would have to bow down and worship Satan. So, of course, Jesus rightly refuses that temptation. But the, the fact, kind of, again, the parallel remains. Uh, he could have tried to seize for something prematurely, but he waited. Just as David could have tried to seize for the crown prematurely, but he waited. And um, circumstantially, though, it seemed like it was falling right into their lap. So that's, again, the emphasis. Don't base your decisions primarily just on what seems to be happening around you. You have to be very careful. And I simply emphasize this because there are some Christians, they're well-meaning Christians, but they are basically sign seekers. They are very dependent on, well, you know, like because of like this thing happened in my life, clearly this has to be a sign that uh, God wants me to do this or that. And the truth is, sometimes that is the case. Like God does send, you know, circumstances uh, to providentially kind of weave us where he wants us to go. But again, we can't make the final decision based merely on circumstances, but on God's word. Okay? That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, based on what we see here in the text, is we need to be a people who exercise patience. Uh, as Christians, we need to be a patient people. This is actually one of the premier virtues of all Christianity itself. It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit we learn in Galatians chapter 5. And uh, God demands it of us uh, so often in Scripture. It's amazing when you go throughout the scope of Scripture how often uh, the exhortation to patience or waiting upon the Lord actually reoccurs. It's all over the place, and we see it in so many of the narratives. In our narrative today, uh, David again, for him to not kill Saul in the cave, therefore required extra patience. He could have thus potentially seized the crown and become, you know, top man right away. Or, I don't kill him, and I have to endure potentially many more years of exile in the wilderness. So he had to be patient. Uh, the same thing actually for Jesus, right? He could try to seize for the kingdoms of the world right then, or he has to go through three years of earthly ministry and then suffer the indescribable horrors of the cross, uh, where he endured the wrath of his people, all the eternity of wrath uh, for his people on himself in the course of an afternoon. After, we can't even fathom how bad it was, but... He patiently endured that uh, instead of just reaching for the thing quickly, okay? And so it is, again, this is something we just have to understand and grasp as Christians. Uh, again, it's, it's amazing. When you go through all of the saints of God, all throughout Scripture, how often they had to exercise extreme patience. Abraham was promised a son, an heir, and yet it took him uh, decades for that to actually materialize in giving him Isaac. Uh, Jacob had to live and work for his crooked uncle Laban for 20 years before he was able to go out on his own. Uh, Joseph was sold into slavery and then became a prisoner before he was elevated into a high position in Egypt. It was years that he had to go through that. Uh, Moses had to become a, a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years before he could go rescue uh, he, the Hebrews out of Egypt. And on and on you go. Like all of God's saints, for some reason God loves to use this pattern throughout history. He loves to work gradually. He loves to work over the course of long time periods, over years and decades and centuries and millennia even, which thus necessitates his people to be very, very patient. Which frankly is sometimes hard for us as Americans because... We're just so accustomed to being, uh, getting what we want very quickly, which isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes it's a very blessed thing that that can be the case, but nevertheless, it might require extra effort on our parts to be extra patient because it doesn't come perhaps as naturally to us. But all that to say, just basically applying this, in your marriage, be patient with your spouse. In your parenting, be patient with your kids. In your work, be patient with your coworkers and with just the overall station where God has you right now. Uh, if you don't really like your station, be patient and God will make it right in time. 
uh, in the church, be patient with your fellow congregants and your elders. Uh, in society at large, be patient with one another. Be patient with uh, your neighbors. Right? It, it just, it, it's demanded on us to be patient. And I'll just simply say, when I say be patient, that doesn't mean just sit back and do nothing and let, you know, circumstances just play their course. Uh, that's actually not what I'm saying. That's not what it means to be patient. Rather, to be patient means, as point number one said, you obey God's word zealously, rigorously, in faith. You strive to do all that God has called you to do. You are very, very intentional in your obedience. So in your marriage, in your parenting, in your work, in church, in society at large, you do exactly what God says to do in faith, and then you be patient to, in the results of it, knowing that God often has fruit come from it years down the road. So, right, so you can't just be like, I'm going to go hard at it for like the next two weeks and then say, well, nothing's changed. Nothing's happening. Well, you've got you to gotta stick to it literally for your lifetime, which means you've got to have lots of patience. Okay? So that's the second thing. The third and the final thing that I would exhort us from this text is to trust in God's vindication. Trust basically that God will then make things right at the right time. In fact, when you truly trust this, it'll empower you, motivate you to do the first two things that we see here. Uh, David could be obedient and be patient in his dealings in this whole situation because he knows that God will make it right. He knows that God will vindicate him. God will be his avenger, is actually what he literally says in his speech to Saul. And so, likewise for us today, we can trust God, we can do what he says exactly, we can be patient in it, and then we can wait for God to vindicate the situation. God will set things right at the right time. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 19, it says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, written Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Okay? So again, this is just the exhortation. Uh, in life, you're, right, you're going to have people, inevitably, who are your enemies. Uh, you don't like them, perhaps, and they don't like you. And they often try to make life difficult for you. They might try to sabotage the things you do, make uh, just things unpleasant overall. Th there will be people like that in your life from time to time. And in such instances, God's exhortation is to not repay them evil for evil. The temptation is to just go strike them, just as they're striking you, perhaps. But he says, actually, don't do that. And as far as it depends on you, you live peaceably with them. You continue to be faithful. You continue to be patient. Uh, and then God says, I'll deal with them. Right? I will, God will deal with everybody. Like, then nobody gets uh, ultimately off in the end. So you can literally leave it to God. He will take perfect vengeance in his perfect timing. And so we need to remember that when it comes to our personal enemies, like people in your actual you know, circles. Uh, and we should remember this uh, when it comes to any other sphere as well, even national enemies. There are a lot of people in our nation right now who hate God, who hate the church, and who are striving to do everything they can to sabotage the church. And in such times, again, the exhortation is for us as Christians, where God has placed us with what we have, to obey his word, to be patient, and then trust God will make it right in the right time. Like, we can be absolutely certain of it. So let's trust this, and let's glorify God in it. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise you, and we thank you for the many gifts of, uh, and many blessings that you lavish upon us as your church, as your people who have been redeemed by grace through faith in Jesus. And so now, Lord, in uh, light of everything we've just looked at from 1 Samuel 24, we're asking that you would now personally apply it to us once again in the power of the Spirit, that you would use the sword of the Word uh, to pierce us and to convict us and to encourage us and to uh, minister to us exactly what we need uh, at this very moment. Lord, we ask that you would give us the conviction to always obey your Word as the final authority, not our circumstances, not our experiences, not even our traditions, um, but your word as the ultimate and final foundation of everything we do. God, make it so that this is what we do. Lord, we also ask that you would then give us great and steadfast patience in this endeavor, so that as we do this, day in, day out, week in, week out, 
year in, year out, and decade in, decade out, that you would uh, just only ever increasingly strengthen our resolve, not weaken it. Lord, help us from throwing in the towel when it seems like nothing is changing around us, but rather help us to press on and be patient because, Lord, uh, we know that you will vindicate the situation. You will make it right in your timing. So, Lord, help us to remember that as well when we are going through times when we tend to forget it. Lord, if it ever does slip our mind and we're tempted to thus uh, repay evil for evil or take matters into our own hands, Lord, we ask that you would intervene and uh, prevent us from sinning against you in this way. Convict us like you convicted David and thus uh, help us to repent of our sins and to serve you with great zeal and vigor all our days. For Lord, we can't do any of these things apart from your gracious uh, intervention in, our, in us, Lord. We need your grace to accomplish these uh, tasks. And so, Lord, we ask for it now in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The charge for this morning is this. So we just got done singing. God is our mighty fortress, an ever-present help and refuge in time of need. His kingdom is forever, so regardless of what happens on Tuesday, Christ reigns from on high, and he will always do that which is right. And therefore, by the grace of God, and through faith in the living Christ, obey God's word with zeal and vigor, not merely your circumstances. Two, be patient in this obedience. Don't be obsessed with shortcuts or get-ahead quick schemes. And three, trust in God's vindication. God will set things right for you, for, uh, in your, with your loved ones, in this community, and in this nation, etc., at the proper time, according to the counsel of His will. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence, with, before His presence, with, great, in his, with glory and great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.